I want to uh, welcome everybody here this morning. We are absolutely delighted with the crowd. Uh, on the behalf of the Peterson Pew Commission, uh, I'd like to convene our first uh, public forum that we've had. We've had a number of Hill events and meetings uh, within our commission, but this is our first major public event. My name's Jim Bates, and I'm the project director. And I should take a moment to tell you who we are or what we are. Uh, we are a um, commission that was established earlier this year to do two simple things, evaluate elements of the federal budget process and make recommendations in areas that we think there's a, a, a broad consensus and a critical need. Our commission is comprised of a, an incredibly um, knowledgeable and yet diverse cast. Uh, we've got directors of uh, Office of Management and Budget, directors of CBO, Comptroller Generals of the United States, and former members of Congress. So we think that creates a good working basis to look across the broad sector of process reforms independent of uh, partisan and issue-specific concerns. Uh, we are very fortunate to have two um, terrific sponsors, the Peterson Foundation and Pew Charitable Trust. Uh, both of these groups have seen fit to invest a lot of time and resources in a cause that others might not focus on, which is the process and the rules by which we make our uh, budgetary decisions. And uh, we are just very appreciative of that. In conjunction with today's event, we are uh, releasing a paper on uh, President Obama's uh, budget process proposals. You know, the focus with the new administration tends to be more on their fiscal policies, which, you know, certainly is appropriate. Uh, but we've sort of taken a second look at a number of process issues the administration focused on, particularly two that have become somewhat topical and there's been some movement within the last three months right before the recess uh, as you know the house passed a, a statutory version of the pay-as-you-go rule for tax and entitlement legislation you know that rule uh, had expired some years ago though uh, the congress had reestablished a congressional rule that was the uh, equivalent. Also, there's been a lot of discussion in the context of health care with using existing structures and building on them to achieve savings as part of uh, health care uh, cost containment. And one of the ideas has been uh, the creation of sort of an enhanced MedPAC uh, commission. And I hope that comes up during the, the discussion uh, today. But anyway, you might uh, take a copy of our paper that's out on the uh, uh, table. And I want to thank Victoria Allred on our staff who put in a great deal of time in doing research and writing uh, associated with that. Uh, we also have a new website uh, at www.budgetreform.org. So I hope you'll look at that uh, uh, website. We'll try to keep it posted as the commission comes out with its former pa formal papers, this one being the, the first. And uh, I think we have some working papers up on that that we were using as sort of internal staff documents just to show you some of the issues uh, that, we're, uh, that we're now uh, looking at. Um, I'd like to introduce the most star-studded panel uh, that you can imagine when you're looking at fiscal affairs. Uh, Bob Reischauer, uh, president of the Urban Institute, you all know him. Uh, he previously served among other capacities, was director of the Congressional Budget Office. Uh, Rudy Penner with uh, the Urban Institute. Uh, Rudy was also director of the Congressional Budget Office and served in multiple positions, I think, at the CEO. Uh, <laughs> Uh, let's see, HUD, as I believe you oh, yeah. had several mm -hmm. positions uh, at HUD, in addition uh, to OMB, where he was chief economist. Uh, Tim Penny uh, served in the House of Representatives and uh, has many, many responsibilities in different groups. Uh, one of the primary is uh, as president and CEO of the Minnesota 
uh, Initiative Foundation, uh, we are um, uh, very pleased that Tim Penny, along with uh, Charlie Stenholm, have joined our other co-chair, Bill Frenzel, uh, to lead the uh, commission. And so that gives us a nice, diverse uh, representation of really three powerhouse co-chairs. And, uh, and we're just so delighted that you agreed to take that on. Uh, Bob Greenstein, uh, everybody knows the fabulous work that comes uh, from the uh, Center for Policy and Budget Priorities. And uh, uh, Bob was you know, both the founder and, and uh, is the director of that uh, very valuable institute. And finally, Jim Nussel. Uh, most recently was director of the Office of Management and Budget, had a uh, long tenure in the uh, Congress and the House of Representatives where he was chairman of the Committee on the Budget, and uh, he now is president of the Nussel Group, uh, a strategic uh, consulting and uh, government affairs group. So anyway, we're um, just delighted to have them participate and share their uh, insights. And now I'd like to turn it out over to uh, uh, our very esteemed moderator. And when we were trying to think of a moderator, someone suggested uh, Mr. Kondracki. And my comment was, there is no way we get him you know, to host <laughs> an event like this. So we are just uh, so delighted that you'd come and help us sort of focus and shed light on uh, some fiscal issues that we think are very important. Uh, I know you're now serving as uh, editor-at-large at, at uh, Roll Call, among other positions, and I uh, want to thank you again for joining us. And I will uh, turn it all over to you. Thank you, thank you. Um, well, this, uh, this group has assembled many times in the past, I think. Um, I feel this is, this is a case of deja vu. Um, I think I first heard that entitlements uh, had to be brought under control when I was a uh, young reporter covering the Ford White House. Um, <laughs> and it's, so it's been ever since. And uh, for at least the last 10 years, uh, many of the people on this panel uh, have been saying, and Maya McGinnis, is, uh, our, our host today at uh, New America, has been saying that the, uh, the fiscal future is, quote unquote, unsustainable. Um, and, uh, you know, the horror statistic has always been that uh, in 2050 or 2040 or 2030, uh, the, the date keeps moving back, uh, the um, just four federal outlays, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, and interest on the national debt are going to eat up the entire federal budget, 20 percent of GDP, um, which uh, is unsustainable because it would mean that we either have to give up the Defense Department and the Veterans Administration and the National Parks and everything else that government does uh, or double taxes. Um, and so um, uh, those are choices that, uh, that nobody, want, nobody wants to face. Um, now the current economic crisis uh, has made matters uh, all the worse. Um, the CBO and OMB just came out this summer with, uh, with, new, with new numbers indicating that uh, the accumulated deficits over the uh, next uh, 10 years are going to be 9 to $10 trillion, um, and that uh, the debt held by the public will have risen from 33% of GDP uh, when President Bush became president to 54% uh, this year to 68% in, uh, in 2019, and that the gross federal debt is going to go from $10 trillion in 2008 to $20.7 trillion in 2019, which will be more than 100 percent of, uh, of GDP in that, uh, that period. So um, uh, President Obama has said that he will not kick the can down the road on this, uh, on this crisis. Um, he said that uh, health care reform is the same as fiscal reform. He's introduced this, uh, this PAYGO. Um, system uh, that he um, will, which will uh, uh, supposedly limit spending on mandatory um, mandatory programs at least year by year. Uh, it, it's not clear that it would pay down any of the obligations that we already have. In fact, it's clear that it won't. Uh, but it's designed to constrain uh, future mandatory spending. Uh, he's also endorsed or proposed um, so-called MedPAC on steroids in order to get. Um, uh, Medicare costs un under control. 
Uh, and he told the, uh, the Washington Post's uh, editorial uh, page direct uh, editor, Fred Hyatt, uh, in an interview not long ago that he's also in favor of tax reform and social security reform and uh, possibly a commission uh, on entitlements. So all of, those, uh, all of those kinds of things are in play. Um, the way we're going to do this today is that uh, each of the panelists will talk for about three to five minutes on uh, what, uh, what he thinks um, the, the crisis looks like, how much worse has it become. I hope uh, some people will answer that. Uh, what do you think ought to be done? And then, of course, comment on the specific PAYGO and um, MedPAC proposals that are discussed in this, in this new paper by the Peterson uh, and Pew uh, Commission. So uh, with that, I will start with Bob Reischauer. So three to five minutes for each of you, and then we'll have a discussion and, amongst ourselves, and then we'll throw it up to questions from the audience. Um, Bob. Okay, thank you, Mort. Um, looking out at this audience and how many people are in the room, I feel compelled to uh, play the role of the uh, flight attendant on the airplane, which says, you know, uh, this airplane's going to New York. Are you sure you're on the right plane? Uh, <laughs> you know, the one to Las Vegas, to uh, Reno, to other more desirable places is at gate 55. Uh, but uh, it is a little surprising uh, that this many people uh, at this time would uh, be interested in this topic. We probably have everybody in Washington uh, who falls into that food group uh, here this morning. Uh, as, as Mort said, we really have two problems facing the nation. Uh, the first is how do you keep uh, congressional actions and executive actions from making the deficit situation look worse uh, than it already does? And second, what do we do about uh, improving that situation uh, over the long run? And I'm just going to go down what I think is really the logical uh, three-step self fiscal self-improvement uh, list and uh, the order in which uh, they should be uh, addressed uh, as a way of putting PAYGO and other process uh, initiatives uh, in their appropriate perspective. Uh, the first thing we really need uh, is to develop a consensus around a desirable fiscal path for the future. Uh, and uh, we're nowhere near that, of course, now. And uh, we continually uh, appeal to sort of uh, two lines of thought. Uh, one is the emotional, you know, what will uh, happen to your kids uh, with this crushing debt burden uh, being placed on them? And uh, like the argument with respect to health care, how can we be the richest country in the world and have 46 million people uninsured? Uh, everybody agrees with the argument, but nobody will act on it. Uh, the second uh, line of reasoning is uh, the uh, uh, fear factor, uh, you know, that uh, the world is going to collapse in the not too distant future uh, if we uh, continue on this path. And uh, unfortunately, uh, whereas many of us thought six, eight months ago that this was a uh, argument that was going to have increasing saliency, uh, I'm afraid uh, we have turned a corner and the reverse may in fact be the case. Uh, that if I came to the assembled wisdom in this room uh, a year and a half ago and said, uh, you know, the deficit is going to go from uh, 460 billion to 1.6 trillion or 3.2 percent of GDP to 11.2 percent of GDP in one year, what do you think is going to happen? Uh, we would have played out a lot of dire uh, consequences and yet you walk around the street and it doesn't look like much is happening. Unemployment rate's very high, you know, the economy is weak, but uh, um, it's not the kind of catastrophe that uh, brings fear to the hearts of politicians and decision makers about their reelection prospects, I don't think. So step one is we have to develop a consensus around uh, uh, desired future fiscal path. Step two is we need agreement on the policies that will put us on this path, uh, and that's what we did in 1990, 1993, and 1997. Uh, there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of coalescing around uh, a group of uh, policies uh, yet. Uh, 
the third step is we need enforcement mechanisms, uh, which PAYGO is one of, to enforce whatever measures uh, we decide to pursue. Uh, as I said, we don't have one or two uh, in this list, and so uh, we have uh, a tendency to focus on three, process change. Uh, but in a way, this is putting the cart before the horse. Uh, and if we've learned anything over the last uh, 20 years of experience, it is that uh, you, know, you can't uh, substitute process for political will. Uh, you can't force the political system to do that which it believes uh, is not in its uh, short-run uh, interest. Uh, when evaluating things like IMAC, the Medicaid, MedPAC on steroids, or the PAYGO proposal of the president, uh, I think we have to keep in mind just a couple of uh, important points uh, from the experience of the last decade and a half. One is that uh, whatever the process change is, it has to be viewed as fair. And unfortunately, uh, fair is in the eye of the beholder, the definition of fair. Uh, and some of us think fair means uh, it has to be balanced and include revenues as well as uh, spending or discretionary spending as well as mandatory spending. Uh, but others start from the premise that spending is too high uh, and taxes uh, are too high. And so there's fairness means focusing all on spending or focusing all on mandatory spending because that's where we uh, see the future problem arising from. Uh, the other uh, lesson from the past, I would say, is uh, no matter how egregious the transgression uh, that the process, the PAYGO or whatever, is trying to correct, uh, the steps should be extremely measured. There is no need to make uh, the uh, punishment fit the crime. Uh, the important thing is you need credibility. And uh, when uh, the kid misbehaves and you spank him, and then he misbehaves again and you <laughs> spank him four times rather than just two times, and you think, well, you know, raising the stakes here is going to get me to where I want to go, it doesn't with the kid, and it doesn't uh, with the political system either, as, uh, as um, the Graham Rudman Hall process uh, indicated. Uh, you get uh, punishment that is non credible. Uh, and uh, the system begins to ignore it. I will stop at that point. Okay, Rudy. Well, thank you, Mark. Um, well, I'm not one to believe that we can use reforms of the budget process to solve our long-run budget problems. Uh, that doesn't mean that rules aren't important. They are. Uh, but they can only be used to nudge the Congress in the right direction. Uh, you can't bludgeon them into doing the right thing. Um, and, and rules that cause too much political pain are just bound to be waived or ignored. Um, the ideal rule uh, allows a legislator to say something like, uh, I'd really like to end your subsidy for eating hot fudge sundaes, uh, but the rules won't let me, and, uh, so that they can convey blame to somebody else. So how do we get the legislature to start looking at this long-run problem? Uh, how I wish I knew. Uh, as Bob said, uh, we're a long way from even looking at the problem seriously. Even after 35 years in Washington, I'm naive enough to believe that when we have major policy debates like the current one about health policy, well, they might not get anywhere, but at least they'll educate the public. And every time I learn that they tend to diseducate the public, if, if that's a word. Um, a few politicians uh, even want to admit right now that some, someone, somewhere, someday is going to have to give up something to solve uh, this problem. So we have a president arguing that health reform will not change anybody's relationships with doctors or insurance companies. Well, it darn well better <laughs> we're going to be drowning in, uh, in health costs. We have Republicans putting themselves in the position that they'll never be able to cut a dime from Medicare uh, should they sometime uh, get into power. I, I think, though, there is some good news if, if one looks abroad. The good news is that um, 
democracies uh, with a variety of constitutional arrangements have been able to uh, reform their social security systems radically. The bad news is that none of those reforms uh, occurred without first experiencing uh, a budget or economic crisis. Uh, in the case of Sweden and Japan that did remarkable things, uh, it was a full-blown economic and budget crisis that caused them to move. In the case of countries uh, like Germany and Italy, uh, they went through various stages, uh, but some of it was motivated by a purely artificial crisis, the Maastricht rules that uh, demanded limits on, on their deficit caused them to move, uh, even though if they'd missed those limits, it wouldn't have been a, a serious economic problem. So I think that's really the trick here, is to invent some mechanism that causes an artificial crisis, uh, one with, that provokes action without doing much economic harm. And we have managed that inadvertently in the past. Uh, uh, with Social Security reform in 1983, um, actually the gap between revenues and outlays at that point, point were very, was very small. Uh, but we had an accounting crisis, not an economic crisis. The trust fund was empty. Um, and uh, eventually, with great difficulty, mind you, we did pass some very important reforms. Uh, similarly, the inability to achieve the targets specified by Graham Rudman uh, created a political crisis, not an economic crisis, but a political crisis that led um, to the Budget Enforcement Act. Um, and that uh, worked quite well for a number of years in the 1990s. But all that was totally inadvertent. So the, the trick is to uh, purposely invent something like that now. Uh, Gene Sterling and I have thought that maybe you can do something like that with triggers. Um, for example, a signal that Social Security was in financial problem would automatically change, uh, make changes in the benefit formula uh, and or in the payroll tax base. Um, it's hard to design any trigger that results in rational policies that pulled a number of times uh, but the point is to create something of an emergency that induces the Congress to do something more rational. Um, we also advocated quite a long time ago, actually, uh, something like the uh, Medicare proposals that the President has now adopted, where you'd have an expert committee make uh, proposals that would be voted up or down, um, and uh, we backed it up if they voted it down with, um, with a blunderbuss policy, admittedly, uh, uh, cut in reimbursements, hoping that uh, such an irrational policy would pressure the Congress into doing something more rational. Again, the trick is to design a trigger that imposes enough pain to get the Congress to do something, but not one that is so painful as to have the Congress ignore it uh, or waive it as they do uh, with the trigger affecting physician fees. And that's no easier trick, and it's much easier to do with Social Security than Medicare. Well, with regard to uh, PAYGO, um, I actually think the President's design for a base is uh, more practical uh, than basing one on current law. I depart from my colleagues, the Committee for uh, the Responsible Federal Budget, in saying that. Uh, but again, I think that a, uh, any kind of uh, rule that imposes enormous pain is just bound to fail. The reason that PAYGO worked so well in the early years of the 1990s um, was that it didn't really expect much. It was only a rule that prevented the deficit from getting worse. It was not a rule that caused the deficit uh, to be reduced. If you based a, um, if you based a rule on current law, today because of all of the temporary tax measures uh, in, in current law, it would actually demand quite enormous deficit reduction. And I think that just wouldn't work. Um, so um, I like the President's approach. Uh, I think we should do it, but it's not going to make any dent in the budget problem. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I believe it was John Dingle who once said that if you give me control over process and I give you control over policy, I'll beat you every time. 
uh, which is to say that process uh, does matter. It may not be the be-all and the end-all, uh, but it does matter. Uh, but context also matters. Uh, Rudy has uh, given us some of that context by recounting uh, the history of our budget efforts over the last couple of decades. Uh, I was uh, here for that Social Security debate back in 1983, uh, and we had waited then until the crisis was upon us. Uh, but we formed a blue ribbon bipartisan panel, which by hook or by crook uh, did come up with recommendations which were then adopted. Um, a, a few years later, we, um, we saw ballooning uh, deficits and a bipartisan group, uh, Graham, Rudman, and Hollings in the United States Senate, brought forth an idea that had the elegance of simplicity that we would balance the budget within five years uh, in equal increments each year, and if Congress didn't take action to reach that goal, then automatic cuts would be imposed. Uh, and there was a bipartisan coalition in the House that embraced that idea. Republicans then uh, uh, had trouble opposing the notion. There was the Democratic Budget Group, which I co-chaired, the Blue Dogs and others, uh, Blue Dogs before they were Blue Dogs, and others that came together to make that inevitable. However, there were too many loopholes, too many exemptions, uh, and then ultimately we blinked uh, when the trigger uh, hit. Um, the, the BRAC Commission uh, came about not too much later. I was actually surprised the first time that Dick Army brought that to a vote, that it came within just a few votes of passing, it took on a life of its own, and in a bipartisan fashion within short order, uh, we created this commission and we uh, stuck to that regimen for several years and actually uh, eliminated some military bases across the country. And then, of course, the Budget Enforcement Act, where we sent uh, a bipartisan group of leaders along with White House uh, personnel down to Andrews Air Force Base to hammer out uh, a budget agreement in 1990 that included uh, those budget process reforms that imposed spending caps on the discretionary budget, firewalls so you couldn't crosswalk money from uh, savings in the domestic area into defense or vice versa, and, uh, and then the PAYGO process for entitlement, new entitlement spending and new tax cuts. And that worked pretty well, uh, in part because Perot was a factor in the 1992 election, and that compelled President Clinton to embrace and extend the Budget Enforcement Act. Uh, it continued to work throughout the balance of that decade because Republicans took control of Congress in 1994, and there was, in a sense, a check and balance. Uh, the Budget Enforcement Act, uh, with its limitations and strictures, uh, worked well for the Republicans in terms of thwarting Clinton's uh, initiatives, and it worked well for Clinton in terms of thwarting Republican initiatives. Uh, then everything went out the window in 2000 with one party control of the process. And uh, the public disengaged because by then we were back, uh, thanks to the economy largely, and the, the fact that we couldn't spend the increased revenue during the decade of the 1990s uh, due to the Budget Enforcement Act, uh, the, the economy then helped us to uh, secure the revenues we needed to get back to a balanced budget, but it, it left the public being somewhat complacent. Uh, and so Congress said, well, we got this extra money, let's do something with it, so they gave it back in a tax cut, and uh, then of course a recession hit and one thing led to another, uh, and, uh, and uh, Medicare Part D became part of the equation, and all of this was done uh, in a context of no uh, budget uh, process limitations. Um, so now we're back uh, to one party rule, but it's a different party. Uh, and I will give Obama credit for uh, putting this issue uh, out there. Uh, I think his intentions are good. Um, his exemptions are worrisome. Uh, and when you look at what's happening on Capitol Hill, it's, it's evident that most members really would prefer uh, a process that's driven by congressional rules as opposed to a statute. Uh, and we've also seen time and again that even if a process is put in place, uh, it's often difficult for them to stick with the process. Uh, um, an example of that is uh, the uh, requirement that we take a hard look at Medicare uh, whenever uh, general fund revenues exceed 45 percent of Medicare's costs, and we blithely ignore uh, that trigger when it's, it's hit. Nonetheless, we've got tea parties going on, so there's some evidence that the public is re-engaging. Um, however, my fear is that they're re-engaging on a very simplistic level. Uh, they think this is easier uh, to, to do than it is. Uh, an example of that is uh, what's happening with this whole debate about uh, the Medicare um, uh, uh, recommendations and, and the possibility of creating a, a med pack on steroids, as it's been called. 
Uh, that leads to countercharges that these are death panels, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, and, and yet uh, the problems are more severe today, and if we don't look very seriously at savings in the area uh, of Medicare, I don't know how we uh, get ahead of this problem. Uh, Bob Greenstein and, and, and others are right to say that health care is the main issue, but if our health care solutions and the private sector are to uh, focus on portability and, and coverage of pre-existing conditions, those are things that will drive insurance rates even higher. And if, and if on the, and the government programs uh, we uh, play politics with issues like this Medicare uh, uh, advisory commission, uh, <coughs> that, that is perhaps the only way we're going to get to any serious discussion about serious reforms in the Medicare program, um, you know, I don't know where the cost control is going to come from. Um, so as I, as I look back over the history of this uh, as a retired politician, that's maybe the one, uh, the one uh, uh, asset I can bring to the table here is a little bit of a uh, sense of how these things happened over time and where that might point us in terms of any process reforms uh, going forward. Uh, I would suggest that um, the only way this has ever been done in the past is outside the normal process. Uh, the Social Security Commission, uh, the uh, sequestration that was part of the Graham-Rudman Law, uh, the BRAC Commission, uh, the 1990 Budget Summit, which was a leadership summit. The only way we've ever done serious process reform or, or put serious effort on deficit reduction in the past is through something that's outside the normal process. Uh, secondly, the only time we've ever made progress is when those efforts have been bipartisan, one way or another. A bipartisan Commission for Social Security, Graham, Rudman, Hollings, um, a bipartisan group leading the effort in the Senate, the 1990 summit, uh, uh, or, or the bipartisan standoff between Clinton and the Republicans during the 1990s. Uh, the, the third is that uh, it, it only seems to happen when there's true public engagement that seems to be emerging right now uh, with, uh, with uh, the public uh, reacting negatively to what they see as out of control uh, spending at the federal level and deficits uh, uh, at alarming levels. Uh, but as Churchill once said, you can trust the Americans to do the right thing after they've tried everything else. And too often we, we do wait until the crisis hits, uh, and this time, uh, given uh, the looming um, challenges that surround Medicare, Social Security, our retirement programs, and, and the deficit we begin with uh, before we even get to those larger deficit-threatening challenges, uh, I don't think we can afford to wait for the crisis, which makes it all the more important that we uh, do put some focus on process now, because while process can't fix this for us, it can, it can set the rules of the game that make it more likely that we'll get this right. Bob Reischauer. I mean, uh, sorry, uh, Bob Greenstein. Uh, thank you. Well, I'm a long-standing <clears throat> advocate of strengthening various budget procedures and enforcing them like pay-as-you-go. Uh, but having said that, I'm squarely in the rice shower camp. The too heavy a focus on process puts the cart before the horse, and we really need to be focusing first on the horse. Uh, the bottom line, I think, is that there are very major limits on what budget procedures and rules can accomplish if there isn't a political consensus about the importance of deficit reduction and some of the basic policy framework on how you have to get there. Well-conceived budget rules such as PAYGO, when they've been successful in the past, they've been successful in enforcing agreements that were already made on the budgetary path, but we have no historical evidence of budget procedure being effective in forcing Congress and the White House to make specific deficit reduction changes in the absence of some kind of agreement or general consensus to move in that direction. PAYGO itself is an example of this. It was enacted in 1990 as part of the bipartisan budget deal of that year that included major tax increases and spending reductions made on a bipartisan basis. And its principal intention was to lock in the deficit reduction that was included in the bipartisan 1990 agreement so there wouldn't be backsliding. And it worked well for about eight years. But in the late 1990s, particularly when surpluses returned, the consensus about deficit reduction broke down and PAYGO was simply waved away several years before it actually went <laughs> off the books. Now, 
you have to ask yourself the question that if even a rule that is well designed and has a history of effectiveness, as PEGO did for eight years, breaks down when the consensus on budget policy and budget deficits disappears, how can we expect process rules that are aimed at going way beyond PEGO? PEGO simply is designed to lock in agreements already made and keep things from getting worse. When you're talking about process aimed at forcing choices on taxes and spending for which there is no consensus, if you can't even hold on to something like PAYGO in the absence of a broader political consensus, I think there's little hope of forcing much tougher, politically harder changes in the absence of a consensus. And an illustration of how little consensus we have right now is reflected in the fact that unfortunately, the administration's PAYGO proposal with a number of exemptions under which extensions of current policies such as tax cuts, AMT relief and the like, uh, the ex cost of extending them would be excluded from the PAYGO rule. Unfortunately, uh, those exclusions were probably a good idea as part of a current PAYGO proposal because <coughs> If we put PAYGO back in effect on a statutory basis, we all know that every one of those policies is going to get a PAYGO waiver anyway. And so we're kind of forced with the uh, Hobson's choice of do you want a PAYGO rule that right out the bat is waived willy-nilly, or do you want to put various big expenditure items outside the PAYGO rule in the hope that that gives you a better chance of holding on to PAYGO for all the stuff that comes in the future, regardless of which side you come down there. The dilemma shows you the degree to which we do not have consensus uh, at the current time. Now, recognizing this, some people say, let's just go to a commission. I'm not one of the people who says that. Uh, the last deficit reduction commission we had was in 94. It was the Kerry Danforth Commission. I was able to see it close hand because I was one of the commissioners on that commission. That commission was an utter failure. We couldn't even agree on a majority report that said anything at the end of the commission. <laughs> Why not? The reason is simple. There was no consensus. There was no interest on the part of the Republican leadership of the Congress, Newt Gingrich and others, Democratic leadership, including President Clinton. There was no interest in the commission hammering out a bipartisan agreement and in the absence of a commitment and a consensus on the part of the leadership, the commission utterly failed. Now, there's been mention here of the Greenspan Commission on Social Security having been successful in 83. Why was it successful? Because Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill had basically agreed before the commission started that there was a need to act on Social Security and that both benefits and Social Security payroll taxes needed to be on the table. And in the final weeks when the real commission agreement was hammered out in late 82, early 83, basically the White House and Tip O'Neill through surrogates negotiated the agreement. It actually was not, contrary to what Tim just said, outside the normal process in the sense that it was the leaders of the parties doing the negotiations and using the commission as their negotiating tool, very different than the Curry-Danforth Commission in 94, where the leaders of the parties were outside it, so you couldn't make any progress. Nor do I think the Brack Commission has anything much to tell us about where to go. Recognize that what happened with Brack is, again, we had a bipartisan consensus that in the aftermath of the Cold War, we had too many military bases and we needed to close some. There was a bipartisan agreement on that. The difficulty was that given parochial issues, you had problems moving legislation through Congress on the regular order to say we're going to close base in Congressman X's district but not in Senator Y's district. So a panel of military experts was formed to pick which commission, which bases to close. But the context was an agreement to close bases. Right now we have no agreement. <coughs> what should be the size of government? What's an appropriate level of revenue? What should the safety net for seniors look like? We don't have agreement, so we're not in a, uh, in a BRAC-type uh, basis. And I would also dissent some with Rudy, uh, from Rudy, about the role of Graham Rudman. I don't think Graham Rudman had 
much of a role in leading to the 1990 bipartisan deficit reduction agreement. The fact that we had two Graham-Rudman laws in 85 and 87, both of which were followed by failure on the Graham-Rudman front, really reflected the fact that we had a larger atmosphere there where there was some bipartisan agreement that deficit reduction was needed. And what opened the door to the 90 agreement was not Graham-Rudman. It was that, to their great credit, Dick Darman and the first President Bush, at, at political risk, agreed to move on taxes, and Democratic and, and people like Bob Dole did too, and Democratic leaders like Tip O'Neill and Dan Rostenkowski agreed to move on Medicare and certain benefits. And that was the single most important breakthrough, uh, I think, that led to what happened in 1990. So given that, what the hell do we do? Well, I think the most important step right now is for progressives and conservatives concerned about deficits to make the case to their fellow progressives and conservatives that we've got to act and that each side has to move off of long established positions. Conservatives who care about the deficit have to go to their fellow conservatives and sell the case that we are going to need a higher level of revenues well designed. Progressives have to go to their fellow progressives and make the case that we cannot continue to advance ideas such as no benefit changes in programs like Social Security and Medicare. Uh, this has to be done on a number of fronts. One small example on September 30th, uh, we, our center, and the Center for American Progress are jointly sponsoring a conference on deficits and deficit reduction. Uh, mainly designed to pursue the goal that I just mentioned. Uh, each of us has to move people in respective camps. Uh, to, to sum up, uh, the single, in, in looking through all the writings on budget process in the past, to me the single passage that stands out is one from a 1993 CBO report, I suspect Bob Reischauer had a little to do with this, uh, on what we could learn from the experience of Graham Rudman and the successful 1990 budget agreement. And uh, just briefly, this passage says, quote, the past indicates that efforts to reduce the deficit are most likely to be successful if the President and Congress first agree on policy actions and then set up processes to enforce them. Deficit reduction does not work as well if the process changes precede the policy actions. Processes are not as good at forcing agreements, however, as they are at enforcing them. Procedures are important, but they shouldn't be asked to do what they can't. If agreement exists on policy actions, many of the major process changes that have been advocated are superfluous. The Congress and the President should avoid temptation to substitute process for policy, but should recognize the importance of process in ensuring that policy changes are realized. Jim Nussel. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mort. And uh, the, the gentlemen that have gone before uh, have, uh, as the old adage said, have said everything. I just haven't said it yet. So I'll, I'll try and be brief. But I, in listening to that last passage, it strikes me that um, uh, while that all is uh, very true, and I, I, I don't think anyone could have said it better, um, I will say, having watched this process, actually, I think I've written now uh, some total. I think I was part of writing or directly leading the writing process of, I think, uh, eight budgets. Uh, I can tell you that, you know, the tools are in the toolbox. I mean, the, the tools have always been in the toolbox. Um, whether or not policymakers and leaders actually go in the toolbox and take one of the tools out and use it is the is the challenge. Um, it's you know it's the whole thing about you know everyone wants to go to heaven but no one wants to die. I mean my my son just moved to Chicago. Uh, he's uh, taken a gap year, and so as a father of a uh, of a 19 year old, you know you you try and do your best to uh, stake his claim with a little advice. Uh, about uh, what the real world is going to be like, and I will not share all of the different things I told my <laughs> my son uh, because some of them uh, would be either embarrassing to me or to him. But one I told him was, "Don't spend money uh, that you don't have." 
Uh, now, that's a principle that we all understand, we all think we live by, but I can tell you that it went in one ear and out the other until, and he's only been there a month. So, and I haven't gotten a call from the bank or the police, but I know that there's going to be a period of time soon when he will experience what that means firsthand. Uh, he will write a check where, with no money in the account. Uh, he'll go to the ATM wanting to go on a date, and there isn't any money that comes out. I mean, there's all sorts of things that will uh, manifest itself very quickly if he doesn't live up to that principle. Um, so I, I, both in dealing with people like President Bush and Newt Gingrich and, and Dick Gephardt and John Spratt and, and friends and foes and, and competitors alike, I can tell you there's no silver bullet in dealing with them and there's no silver bullet in dealing with your 19-year-old son when it comes to the principle of, of fiscal responsibility. Uh, it comes down to choices. It comes down to choices that are made based on what is inside an individual. In Washington, it's a political choice. And very eloquently, I think Tim Penny uh, uh, stated the case very wisely. Until the people understand, until the people that elect the folks that come out here understand that this is important and it manifests itself in their day-to-day -day living, that this is a damn important issue, uh, it isn't going to be. It just isn't going to be. Now, when is that going to happen? I don't know. I mean, I don't know what the crisis is going to be because we all are in the room here today because we see, we clearly see the crisis. You can say it in health care, Social Security. You can say it in the transportation. You can do it a lot of different ways and say, well, this, this is a clear indication that it's coming. Um, I think the one that's probably going to hit home the quickest and the soonest and in nearest term is probably the one that some of us once in a while have faced, whether it's in small business or getting a loan to buy a house, and that is when you go to the bank and the bank won't give you any more money. Or the interest rate is just so damn high you can't afford it. And you say, well, I, it isn't going to happen anymore. And I think that's maybe when it's going to happen, is, uh, is, is when we find out that the people that have been lending us the money, whether it's Americans or, or people abroad, uh, say, either A, no more, or not at that rate. It's got to be a lot higher, and a lot higher still, and even higher still. And that's when I think, I, maybe I mean, I'm practicing without a license with those on the panel here who are economists, but uh, that's what I see. And that's when I see it going to happen and manifest itself very clearly in town meetings across uh, the country. That's when it's really going to hit home, because these tools are really about a political person, uh, as, as I've experienced, being able to say no. That's what it comes to. To make that choice often requires someone to say, uh, you just crossed the line. No, we can't. you can't have that transportation money. We can't expand that health care program. You can't have that tax relief. Whatever it might be, it's the ability of, of someone to say, uh, no, we can't do that. Because traditionally and, and uh, by common sense, the way you get elected is by saying <coughs> yes. It's not by saying no. Uh, that's true in dealing with your constituents. It's, all tr it's also true if you're running for leadership. It's also true if you're trying to pass legislation on the floor. It's also true if you're in the White House trying to get the House and the Senate to do anything with your proposals. So getting to yes is, is the, the goal, and the tools that we've put out there tend to be uh, about about trying to put in a speed bump. Uh, so enforcement in a political process can really only ever be by political enforcement. And that will occur when the political system realizes, uh, the voters, our constituents, that, and, and it's probably going to have to come through better information or transparency or something that manifests itself directly in their economic life, uh, that uh, that they understand the impact of what has been happening or not happening out here uh, very dramatically. Um, these are good tools. Please don't misunderstand me. I just I want us to be realistic, though, that we didn't get here because we had necessarily bad tools. I think we, we got here because we had lack of discipline in a political process. Um, and new tools, uh, revamped tools alone, uh, will not get us there. Uh, 
but I think President Obama has put forth a, a, a fantastic packages. There's, there are members in the House and Senate on both sides. In fact, one final comment I'll make is that please don't think this is just Republicans versus Democrats. The last time I tried to pass and the last comprehensive uh, budget process reform that attempted to pass the, uh, the Congress, uh, Ben Cardin and I wrote, and trust me, we, weren't, we didn't have any problem convincing Republicans and Democrats. We were up against appropriators. We were up against leadership. We were up against uh, the transportation and infrastructure committees. Uh, we were up against those who saw, as, uh, uh, as Tim said, uh, people who understood how to manipulate the process to their own gain and didn't want that process to change. Um, and uh, so it's not just a, you know, shirts versus skins, Republican versus Democrat. There's a lot of different places uh, where this will continue to, uh, to, to continue to be a challenge. Thank you. I'm depressed. I don't know about you. <laughs> um, let, let's, come, let's come back this way with uh, where Jim, Jim Nussel and all of you have been describing. It is, it is the crisis. When, what does it take for... America or the politicians to understand that we have a clear and present danger. It's that it's not, you know, it's not something that's in a movie that uh, David Walker uh, produces or, or, and I'm sure it's not a Tea Party because the Tea Party is a very short-term reaction. It seems to me there is, you know, there is no Ross Perot on the on the on the scene <coughs> who's going to carry this this argument with with policy implications as well. I mean, this is basically just a a scream in the night, I think, although it's quite a loud one. Um, so what does it take? I mean, what, what is, is it that the Chinese say, thank you very much, we're not going to use the dollar as a reserve currency anymore? Is it that Moody's pulls away the, uh, the U.S. government's AAA rating, or if we still have one, I'm not clear on whether we do. Um, well, I mean, what does it take? Why don't we just start uh, with you, Bob? Uh, I think uh, you put your finger on the answer. It will take some external force uh, of some kind, and it doesn't take the Chinese saying, uh, we won't uh, uh, be your lender of last resort. All they have to do is say, we don't want to lend you as much as we did previously. Uh, and we're asking them right now to lend us basically three times what they did the year before. Uh, and it's not irrational for them to decide to diversify their uh, their holdings. And Is there any indication they're going to do it? Interest rates. Uh, I mean, they, they keep run. talking about it, but uh, you know, and kind of kind of threatening, well, and it it's, it I, makes I it onto the front page of the Wall Street Journal sometimes, but I haven't seen it on the front page of the New York Times. Or I, I think it actually wouldn't occur rapidly because they have a lot at stake too mm -hmm. uh, in the stock of bonds and other assets that they. They hold, uh, but it, and it might manifest itself in a very different way, which is, uh, you know, a reaction to us putting uh, tariffs on their tires. Uh, you know, the fact of the matter is, uh, uh, he who pays the piper calls the tune, and uh, we uh, are have to think about that kind of thing in our foreign policy and in our other policies. So I, but I don't see uh, there being a moment at which uh, Republicans and Democrats make the kind of uh, decisions that uh, Bob Greenstein laid out, which is, uh, okay, folks, you know, taxes inevitably are going to be higher, and uh, uh, mandatory uh, benefits are going to have to be shaved. Um, well, I agree with Bob. Uh, it's very hard to see a solution without seeing it imposed on us from the outside. And I've just been mind blown uh, with the ease with which we've s sold a massive amount of debt this year. Uh, I couldn't believe the auction last week that was oversubscribed for 30 year bonds at a 4.5% interest rate. Um, so I can't, uh, I can't explain uh, quite what's going on. But there have been a number of instances in the past where markets have disciplined the system, most notably. In 1980, um, poor Jimmy Carter put out a budget in January. I think it had a $13 billion
billion dollar deficit, something like that, <laughs> when uh, the marketplace was expecting him to balance the budget. Bond markets went mad. Uh, he had to withdraw his budget and put out a new one several months later. But then, a couple of years later, the markets accepted Reagan's 200 billion plus deficits with equanimity. So uh, it's very hard to know when it's going to happen. Uh, there was some uh, minor, uh, minor uh, activity after the market crash of '87, uh, and a few things got done. I wouldn't say they were very important, but a few things did get done. So it would be nice to have a, I don't know if you call 87 miles, but uh, it would be nice to have uh, some sort of uh, market emergency that uh, didn't do lasting damage, but was sufficient to get the politicians to act. Well, some, uh, just uh, before uh, Tim goes on, I mean, some people have said that inevitably these deficits are going to be, are going to lead to hyperinflation. And certainly the Carter inflation uh, got everybody's attention. Um, and uh, I'm not sure what good results that led to, except the Reagan, Ronald Reagan's election. But um, um, is there hyperinflation in the future on the, on, at the rate that we're going? Tim, you want to take well, that? Well, I think, I think uh, Rudy uh, pointed us in that direction with this comment about you know, we know eventually it'll happen. We just can't predict when. And, um, and I think that's the case here. We know that that's inevitably a consequence of continued deficit spending and borrowing to pay the debt and, and all the rest. Um, but you can't predict it with any certainty. Uh, in addition, you, you can't predict the public response with any certainty uh, when that occurs because that has a different effect on the public psyche. I, I think I think the more I, I think the the crisis if 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 it comes that will have uh, a more salutary effect on the public psyche would be um, uh, um, the the borrowing we need to secure from uh, sources outside the U.S. Uh, causing us to, to pay an awful lot more uh, for interest on on that debt um, because that really uh, will register with. Uh, the electorate. They will see this as evidence of our government uh, um, not only out of, out of control in terms of its fiscal policies, but our government uh, threatened, our, our society threatened by this implication. Uh, and I think that will have um, the effect of the public saying, get a handle on this. Uh, and and uh, so the canary in the coal mine is, is what we see happening as, as new government issues. Uh, are being uh, responded to on the international scene, and uh, and that we that we can't see exactly when that crisis will hit, but we can see indications uh, as as new issues are offered. the The other thing is uh, the midterm <coughs> elections, uh, and the Republicans have lost credibility on on the budget because of what they did when they had eight years of power. But you know, we, despite my best efforts, this is still a two party system. Uh, for the most part. <laughs> and, um, and so if people are unhappy, as I think they will be come uh, November of 2010, with what they've seen so far of democratic control of uh, both uh, uh, branches of Congress and, and the White House, uh, they will respond by voting for more Republicans. And it may not be the right kind of Republicans. Uh, it may not be moderate, so it will help us find some common ground. But it will send a message in that midterm election that will perhaps moderate the path and, and cause uh, Republicans to be more consistent, to return to their fiscal roots, uh, roots that they've lost in the last uh, while, uh, and, and Democrats to be more, uh, moderate Democrats, blue dog Democrats, others to be more emboldened uh, to hold the line on some of these fiscal principles. So that might be the other, uh, the other way that this plays out. Uh, Rudy's comment brought back memories. <clears throat> I remember that 1980 Carter budget. I was running the food stamp program for President Carter at the time, and I remember needing to pull my team in over the weekend. We had 48 hours to design a series of food stamp benefit cuts that then got into the second Carter budget and, and were enacted into law. I, I think the answer to your question, Mort, is um, complex. Uh, so you could take 83, and you could say, well, there was an imminent shortfall. There was an imminent crisis coming in Social Security if action wasn't taken, uh, crisis forced action. And 
you can refer to the bond markets trembling in 1980 in the Carter budget. On the other hand, we had major deficit reduction packages in 1990 and again in 1993, and there really wasn't an equivalent economic or financial market crisis or reaction that suddenly forced those. Uh, those more reflected that we had for a period uh, a broader consensus about the urgency of deficit reduction. And for a period around 1990, we had some bipartisan alignment on uh, the shared sacrifice point. Having said that, the sad story here, I think, is, well, I think the following is greatly oversimplified. I think the political system, many politicians drew the lesson that on the Republican side, President Bush, the first President Bush's willingness to cross the line on the read my lips and to agree to a budget agreement that had a tax increase, heard him in 92 and he lost the election in 92. And I think many people said, yes, the Democrats stepped up to the place, plate on a part, one party only basis and did a heroic deficit reduction package in 1993, and they lost the Congress in 94. Now, I can argue there were a lot of other reasons, the crime bill and other things, that may have had a bigger role. But I actually think a, a I had a history professor in college who used to say, whether consciously or not, policymakers always have in their minds, almost unconsciously, what they view as the lessons of history. And I think right now the political system partly thinks the lessons of history is if you make these tough actions, you may lose the next election. And I don't know what the solution is to get beyond that. Maybe it's to somehow have a modest first step bipartisan package with real changes, not just process, and hopefully the people who do it win the next election rather than losing it. But I think that's a hurdle we somehow have to get beyond. I think there's one more point, and that is I don't want to overstate the importance of this, but uh, I think it will be somewhat easier to talk to the public with more clarity about these issues as the economy recovers, as we're coming out of the recession. I find in discussions I'm in right now, uh, if I talk about the need for midterm, long-term deficit reduction, I immediately get pushback. We're in a recession. We need deficit spending now. We needed the stimulus. And I say, yes, that's true. I'm not talking about the deficit this year. You need deficits in recessions. I'm talking about the mid and long term. Uh, I think people have real difficulty distinguishing that you need one path in a recession for a couple of years, but you need another path for the longer term. And it makes it really hard to clearly explain this. Some people have drawn the conclusion that we shouldn't have done the stimulus package or it should have been deficit neutral in the current year, which would have been terrible macroeconomic policy. We'd have higher unemployment and a deeper recession now if we'd done that. Other people understand we needed to do a, a stimulus package, but it leads them to think that then we don't need to do midterm, long-term deficit reduction. So I actually think all of us across the political spectrum who are concerned about deficits need to be thinking about how, when the economy really does emerge, how we can use the ending of the downturn to get a clearer message across that the time really is now to start taking action on deficits. Good points across the board. Let me just add one other uh, uh, nuance to uh, to this that has nothing to do with the fiscal responsibility toolbox, but a tool that I think would be would be pretty important. Um, Iowa chooses its uh, reapportionment uh, districts based on a nonpartisan commission. It's one of the only states that does that. As a result, trust me, our districts are very competitive. Um, I had to I had to withstand that for uh, for my uh, eight terms in Congress. Um, that is not true across the rest of the country. And while Tim I think is correct that there will be a, um, a kind of a snapback 
Uh, I think we need more competition when it comes to uh, the choice of policymakers and the policies that they choose across the country, more debate, more discussion uh, than the incumbency protection that we have right now, so that many of these issues become part of the debate and can sustain themselves, not only during a time of crisis, but also during uh, what may be calmer times, uh, because these are issues that should have been, as many, many stated here today, should have been discussed during times of surplus. I mean, Ben Cardin and I tried to pass budget process reform. I think it was, if it wasn't in the surplus, we were pretty close to it. Maybe that was a dumb time to do it. Well, it might have been a smarter time, though, if we had more competition, particularly for the, uh, obviously, in the House of Representatives uh, for those seats. And I would just, uh, uh, I would uh, submit the, the Iowa process as one that I think might help there are many others that may help, but the gerrymandering uh, system is not helping us at all. If we have to wait on ungerrymandering the political <laughs> system, we're going to wait a long time. Uh, Bob Rushauer wanted to say one last thing, and then I, then I have another question. Uh, yeah, um, I've spent most of my life agreeing 100% with uh, Bob Greenstein, so I find it a rare opportunity to be able to just uh, uh, disagree on uh, his version of history uh, here. Um, the two times that we have made major changes of this sort, uh, Congress really did have a gun at its head. Uh, with respect to 1983, uh, the trust fund was six, eight months away from depletion, and under current law, the benefits would have been rateably reduced for all uh, Medicaid, uh, Social Security beneficiaries. Could they have done something else, transfer some money in? Sure, they could, but they, but under current law, this is the way the system would operate, and you could uh, build uh, a case for doing something. With respect to 1990, uh, the uh, law of the land was that we were in line for a sequestration under Graham Rudman uh, that OMB would have had to carry out that was equal to 32 percent of discretionary on discretionary spending and non-defense, and 34 percent for non-personnel. Uh, in the military. We had 500,000 troops in uh, Kuwait at that point, and the economy was in recession. Could uh, the president have suggested other uh, ways out? Uh, he could have. It would have been rather embarrassing, I mean, to wave uh, Graham Rudman without doing something on this. So there was really, uh, you know, a gun uh, at the political system's head in both of these instances. With respect to uh, Tim's uh, scenario here, what worries me uh, is that uh, the American public uh, will react in a very nationalistic way if it perceives, you know, what are the Chinese doing uh, this to us for? Uh, and it will, in some ways, maybe make uh, uh, solutions harder to arrive at uh, when you know, in a sense, foreigners are making us cut Social Security or Medicare or raise taxes uh, because Americans don't fully understand. Let's not go back and re re okay. re revisit the history. Okay. Well, well, I think there is an important point. All right, okay. Yeah, no, I mean, as I go said, I, 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 I certainly agree there was a gun to the head in 83. 90, you could argue either way they could have waived Graham Rudden. But there definitely, unless I'm missing something, Bob, wasn't a gun to the head in 93. I mean, what happened in 93 was interesting. Um, in the 92 campaign, deficit reduction became a big issue. Bill Clinton pledged to cut the deficit in half as part of his campaign platform, and then he felt compelled to deliver. The crisis in that case was Ross Perot. Ross Perot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, but, but, but that begs the question. And the question is, what, why was it that the American public and the political system was receptive at that point to Ross Perot's message in the absence of something like the event that would have happened to Social Security in 83? I'm not sure I know the answer, but I think it's an important question because what we're all saying is how do we get back to the kind of atmosphere we had in 92 that helped lay that framework? And so I think that's worth thinking about. Right. Um, let me, let me go to uh, President Obama and his policies now and, and the, the kind of atmosphere that he's created here. Um, he came in saying he understands this problem, that it is a danger, that he's not going to kick the can down the road. Um, 
what's happened? I mean, is it because his, he's, he wants to raise taxes on rich people? Is it because uh, the Congress is spending too much money? Is it, why has he not been able to get the point across to get some action on this? Uh, is, has he not proposed the right things? Has he put it off at uh, de deficit reduction behind um, health care reform and all these, and the, all these other things and not really emphasized it enough? What, what's the problem? Why, why are we in this particular situation, even though we have a president who acknowledges that, that, it's, a, that it's a huge problem? Anybody want to take that? Yeah. So um, this is a rare panel for me. I'm usually the biggest pessimist on the panel. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I actually think that you can see some glimmers of hope in what's happened in the last four or five months. What do I mean by that? Well. You know, for several years, when administrations have had their signature proposal, uh, the Bush tax cuts in 01, the Bush tax cuts in 03, the prescription drug benefit proposal in 04, uh, there was virtually no discussion in the political process of paying for them and doing them on a deficit neutral fashion. And I can tell you that in March and April of this year, when I was in meetings with key senior staff on key committees on Capitol Hill, and I would say at the end of the day, isn't the number one issue your biggest challenge in doing the health care reform bill, how you're going to pay for it, people would say, Bob, we'll do the best we can, but come on, everybody knows at the end of the day we're <coughs> not really going to pay for the bill. Well, things have changed. Uh, starting in May, it really wasn't just in the speech last week, starting in May, the White House made very clear that this was real that you had to have a CBO score that the bill was fully paid for or the president wasn't going to take it. And if you look, you know, we can argue, and I'm not, this is not a done deal, and we can talk about the second 10 years and all of that, but uh, look how far a departure that is from where we were in the past. You know, here we are saying, gee, we're not sure it's paid for in the second 10 years. There basically is a consensus on the Hill and with the president right now that any health care bill must be scored as deficit neutral over the first 10 years. That's not where we were four, five, six months ago. That itself is a sign of progress. And if you concur, as I think most analysts do, that the single biggest factor behind the long-term fiscal problem is the relentless rise of health care costs rising much faster than the economy. And again, you can debate whether how much the bill does to bend the curve and whether we know enough yet as to how to bend the curve and all of that. But the fact is, there is uh, logic to trying to handle health care first, and I would mark as the first sign of real progress that here we have a new president, it's his number one proposal, and he says, I won't accept that unless it's paid for, and the Congress seems at this point to being agreeing with that. So I'd sort of ask the question of, how do we build on that rather than saying, why is nothing happening? You got a different reaction or the same reaction? Go ahead, Rudy. Well, um, you know, Bob is taking great pleasure in the fact that we're not increasing deficits that look like they'll be $9 trillion over the next 10 years. Um, I think that very statement shows how far we have to go. Uh, nobody is talking about specific policies uh, that would reduce the deficit significantly. And that's why I'm so much more pessimistic than he is. Yeah, and, and I don't know whether this would have uh, changed the dynamic uh, appreciably. Uh, Jim Nussel can speak to this more authoritatively than, than I can because I, I think in addition to having lost credibility on fiscal matters, uh, Republicans have also um, quickly fallen into the uh, partisanship uh, on impulse uh, mode. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm not sure that it changed behavior on the part of the president in, in the last eight months um, uh, would have made a big difference on the Republican side of the aisle. Again, Jim might, might have a better sense of that. But, but I think if there were failings on the part of the president, uh, there, are th there are three major failings that come to mind. One is signing into law an omnibus spending bill laden with pork. If, if he was clear about anything with the American public last fall, it was that he was a different kind of Democrat. He was going to bring change to Washington, and the first thing he did 
uh, was to, well, I shouldn't say the first thing, one of the first things he did was to accept pork because it was last year's business and just cleaning up last year's mess. Uh, that sent all the wrong signals uh, to Capitol Hill. Secondly, uh, he allowed Capitol Hill to write the stimulus package and basically said, I'll, I'll say it is what I want it to be regardless what you put in there. Uh, and, and it's hard to describe and defend what this stimulus package turned out to be because it was just loaded up uh, with, with everything from soup to nuts, uh, and we called it a stimulus. Uh, and, and thirdly, on health care, uh, cost control is the key issue here in both the private sector system and in our government programs. And it gets, uh, it gets um, far less attention than expanded coverage uh, and, and protecting seniors and, uh, and uh, allowing portability and pre-existing conditions. I mean, all the stuff that will actually cost us more is what's getting the most attention here. And, and the stuff that will actually save us money is, is not being advocated uh, or defended nearly as strongly uh, by this administration or other health care advocates. And, and so I, th I think you've got, you've got problems on those three fronts and it's, it's, it's leading to uh, gains for the Republicans uh, in public opinion uh, and it may be ill-gotten gains, <laughs> but, uh, but nonetheless, uh, it's beginning to build out there in terms of a public perception that this administration is not serious about getting our fiscal house in order. Um, okay, I think we ought to uh, give some attention to uh, these, this paper that uh, the, the Peterson Pew uh, Commission has put out, um, <clears throat> PAYGO and MedPAC on steroids. Now, uh, I'm not clear, is, is MedPAC on steroids in the Senate finance bill? Uh, I, I'm not, I, that's something I just don't know as a factual basis. I mean, and would, is it strong enough to work? And, the, and would it bend the curve? If you had MedPAC med on steroids, which, which had a lot of power, like a Federal Reserve independent to impose uh, policies on the Medicare system, and some of them seems to, the possibility seems to be fairly draconian. If it's a, if it's a Fed, it's like, you know, they could decide not to give dialysis to 75-year-olds or something like that. Um, but is that is that proposal? Let's just start start with the MedPAC on on steroids proposal. Um, is it a realistic possibility to come out of out of health care reform? And and what what do you think about what the um, the uh, commission has said about its strengths and limitations. Assuming that you read the paper, Jim. I'll, tr I'll try it. I mean, I, uh, when I first heard it, uh, I have to say as somebody who was frustrated, uh, I, uh, I tended to uh, favor it just because out of frustration there must be, there must be a way to do this better than the Congress continuing to uh, fail to impose its own discipline. So, you know, just like a BRAC kind of commission, just like all the other commissions that are dreamed up, you know, that uh, some work, some don't. Uh, but the bottom line for me, and I tend to be a little bit of a purist about this, it is an abdication, I believe, of the Congress's responsibility. They give it to somebody else. Say, we can't do it, we can't decide, it's too political, we'll give it to somebody else. Well, and that's why I keep coming back to this, and I, you know, Mort, you joked about it, that, you know, doing gerrymandering reform might you know, is, is going to be difficult. Yeah, well, it's not any more difficult than any other reforms we've talked about because they haven't been done either. My only point is that this is a political process. And if you don't address politics, you're not going to get to the, to the crux of this. And it's true in Medicare. Uh, it's true in fiscal policy. It's true to me across the board. You need that uh, competitiveness. I think it's easy as uh, it's easy to, uh, Tim was exactly right in his analysis, I think, of the first six, seven, eight months of the Obama administration and the reaction uh, because it was easy for both parties, particularly the Republican Party, to go to that position. They, uh, you could argue that the Democrats and, and President Obama made it easy to go to that position, but they were already predisposed to take that easy position. One way or the other, they got there, uh, but they're not going to move from it unless uh, it's, uh, it's put into a much more competitive uh, context. So uh, my gut reaction when I heard the proposal was, yeah, I guess that sounds like a good way to approach it because nothing else works. But I'm frustrated that it continues to me to, to be, I, I think, a, uh, a refusal to take responsibility for the policymaking process that Congress ought to uh, get paid for and how to do. 
Bob? Um, I sort of uh, bristle at the idea that this is uh, MedPAC, uh, having served nine years on MedPAC, uh, and it plays a very, very different role. But uh, uh, I generally f uh, approve of the uh, President's approach uh, to this, but uh, like CBO, uh, view the potential of this commission as uh, rather limited. It's an independent commission. Uh, it's required to come up with um, Oh, it's required to come up with one set of recommendations a year, which has to do with payment updates uh, for Medicare fee-for-service uh, system. Uh, those payment updates have been quite modest over the last five or six years. Uh, they've been under inflation, if you average them across all components. Uh, so the room, and there's a general feeling, certainly uh, among uh, um, people in the provider community that Medicare is not bearing uh, its full share of costs here. Uh, and, you know, it's not true in some areas, but it is true in others. So the potential uh, for gobs of savings, I think, is very, very limited. Commission comes up with a set of recommendations. Uh, the Secretary of HHS, meaning the administration, has to approve that whole package. Uh, and then it's sent to Congress. Uh, there'll be a lot of pressure on the administration, just as there is on the Congress, if these are too onerous. Uh, so there is a political check and balance. Uh, it then goes to Congress where you need a joint uh, resolution of disapproval for these uh, adjustments not to occur. Uh, and uh, that is a transfer of a tremendous amount of uh, power to the executive branch from uh, the uh, legislative branch. But on the other hand, uh, you know, the fact of the matter is, uh, you know, it isn't necessarily Congress's expertise to decide what uh, individual payment rates should be in a health care system. I mean, this is really uh, down in the weeds. Uh, secondly, the Commission can come up with a set of recommendations on other types of reform as long as they lower uh, baseline costs. Uh, there are a number of areas where uh, the legislation precludes them from making recommendations, but uh, you know there's a wide area where uh, they could. We know if we're going to bend the curve, do something substantial, uh, what we have to do is uh, adopt rather fundamental changes uh, in the way the payment system works that will induce changes in the delivery system. Uh, this is big, big uh, issues uh, and are probably not the kind of thing that should be subcontracted to commissions uh, in a take it or leave it form as opposed to we're putting this on the table, now you guys discuss it. Uh, and I think they would be very controversial. Both the uh, Secretary of HHS might say no and the Congress uh, might easily uh, approve resolutions of disapproval. Um, I just realized that that I am I'm violating the rules here by not throwing this to the to the audience much sooner. Um, I, why don't we do that? But and 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 let the uh, I, I suspect that there will be paygo questions and medpack questions from the audience. So why don't we just start <coughs> now? Any do, anybody who's who wants to raise your hand back in the back there? Yes, I go, go ahead. <clears throat> Thank you. I have a suggestion, which I'd love you to shoot down if it's off base. You asked how to make uh, a deficit reduction a politically, uh, how to motivate people politically. And um, unlike uh, during the Clinton administration, right now, 50 percent of our debt is held by foreign countries. So every dollar we consume today we spent, we pay back with interest 50% of it to foreign countries. The number one holder of our debt is China, who's a competitor and potential military adversary. The number four holder of our debt is, by Treasury says, is our oil producing nations, which include, of course, Iraq, Iran, Libya, and, and uh, other countries that are not necessarily friendly to us. I'm wondering if the case can't be made politically. Uh, on the debt 
and on payments on the debt that were effectively, and tell me if I'm wrong, you guys are the brains, uh, that we are effectively forcing our children to make their credit card payments to countries that would oppose them. Well, Go ahead. Un unfortunately, I, I uh, worry that it might work the other way. That is to say that um, the ease with which we sell debt comes from the fact that Chinese and Japanese and others are trying to depress the value of their currency. It's made it very easy for us to sell it. It's kept interest rates low. Uh, it's made it generally easy to run big deficits. Um, it would be nice to make the kind of case you're making, um, but I, I guess I just don't see it working. Well, I'd, I'd like to put this in a broader context, uh, which is a piece of what you raised, and that's the intergenerational inequity that uh, deficits and, and debt uh, represent. Uh, because uh, th these dollars have to be repaid over time. If interest rates on, on this debt climb, uh, that's, uh, that's robbing future generations of uh, control over the, the federal budget. Uh, too much of the budget is going to be devoted to decisions made decades ago and, and, uh, and costs uh, that, uh, that uh, were, in, were incurred for yesterday's agenda, but the, the interest on those costs uh, uh, will be paid by future generations. So I think there is an intergenerational dimension here. And that's why I think um, uh, you know we, we need to we need to uh, find a way to uh, make this an intergenerational debate. Uh, how much do we really want to burden future generations uh, with the kind of debt that we are incurring? Um, and so, as, as we look at uh, MedPAC on steroids or any other process reforms that that might force us or help us to get more real about how we deal with our deficits. I mean, one way to do that might be to say the recommendations come forward to control these costs of our entitlement programs, uh, and we can reject those recommendations, but then uh, corresponding uh, to that rejection of the cost-saving approaches, we maybe then require ourselves to vote on the tax increases that would be the only other way to pay for these programs without borrowing. Uh, and that makes, it, that makes it more explicit, that if we don't get control of these costs, we really are passing these costs on to the next generation, except let's not do that invisibly through extra borrowed money and interest costs that are hidden in the budget in the years to come. Let's do it explicitly right now with a tax increase right now. And I think that would change the nature of the debate. Yes, sir. Here in front. I'm going to have you running back and forth. Get your exercise. There's an old adage that whenever there's this much uh, confusion and gridlock, people aren't asking the right questions. So a very simple question I want to ask is, how many people in America understand the fundamentals of uh, political capital, how the money system works, and more important, equally importantly, as people have pointed out, uh, the monetary operations? So the way I would an outsider might look at this, when a nation is formed, when they eventually get around to creating a national currency, why do they do that? They do that to be able to denominate all the transactions they want to make. So when it, that right there tells you, if you stop and think about it, that whenever we have a, a discussion about a budget deficit, which is entirely a nominal currency, it's always caused by a, a crisis in public initiative because a, but a currency is always a subset of pub public initiative. So if, if you just ask that question, I think it changes the entire view of everything that is being discussed here today. And there's, I, not, there's I, another I issue I should admit that the least, I mean, look, I think uh, Americans are woefully uneducated economically as to even their own checkbooks, let alone monetary policy. I mean, it is the major, most major failing of the education system that nobody understands monetary policy at all. Um, and and it's, it's, it's only when interest rates go up or inflation becomes a astronomical that people seem to ever pay attention to it. Um, anybody else want have any comment? Yes, sir. I, I'm Mortimer Kaplan. If I was still IRS commissioner, 
I remember when you were. <laughs> <Right>. I'm old <laughs> enough. <laughs> and, and if I heard that your employer was paying for your food or for your shelter or your clothes and you weren't reporting it on your return, I sent a revenue agent over. <laughs> now, why health care? Why is health care more significant than basic food? Now, it was, a, it was an accident, really, during <laughs> World War II, when we had wage price control. And it was, the IRS changed this ruling policy and made it possible to have hidden wages. Now, what chance today do you think that you could have some tax above a level, of course, for your health care package? McCain was for this. And could you do it today? By putting a tax on the insurance companies for the, the golden type of health care package, you're going to have that cause passed along. I'd be interested in your views. I think it's inevitable that over time we're going to have something like that. And as you know, a number of the proposals that uh, Congress is debating uh, have, uh, you know, things like that. It's... Uh, that said, uh, there is a tremendous complexity in this uh, that is generally overlooked, and that is uh, that insurance policies are expensive uh, because of the richness of the benefits they provide, but also because of uh, the nature of the group. Uh, you know, is it filled with old and sick people, or is it a whole bunch of young, healthy people? Uh, and geography, the cost of the same package for the same type of people across the country varies maybe two to one in price. And those two factors uh, make it politically difficult to go too far down this line. But, you know, I think enough, there's enough consciousness of the arguments that you've laid out uh, so that uh, if it doesn't happen now uh, in this round of health reform, it's uh, I would say is going to happen uh, in the not too distant future. It's um, it's going to be instructive to look at what happens in the coming weeks. Now, um, in my view, I, I suspect most other members of the panel would concur. It would have been desirable, as you suggest, as part of this package, to put a cap on uh, the employer exclusion uh, and. Clearly, that isn't happening, but uh, it is progress that um, the president in the speech last week did endorse uh, an excise tax on value of insurance policies over a certain level. And in the chairman's mark that Senator Baucus brought out about an hour ago as we're sitting here this morning, uh, it is in that mark. Now, having said that, uh, I was on a phone call uh, with someone who works for one of the senators on the Finance Committee about 6 o'clock last night who was saying to me, you won't believe how much last-minute lobbying we are getting to reduce or knock out that excise tax. And I think the outcome... Is that, is that from unions or from who? Well, I, I think unions are particularly active, but I don't think it's limited to unions. I think the insurance companies are working against it as well. But, the, uh, but, but let me just ask you, I mean, they're just going to, as uh, the commissioner said, going to pass it on, right? So why would the insurance companies be um, against it? That's a good question. I'm not sure I know the answer to that. Um, but in any event, we're, we're, we will see how this plays out. One of the things that um, I have found striking is, um, I won't name names, don't ask me to, certain <laughs> people saying, um, the subsidies are not adequate for low and moderate income people to afford coverage in this package, a concern I share. And then saying, by the way, we have to get rid of or eliminate the excise tax. Uh, where's the money supposed to come from then for the subsidies? But this is a, this is a very interesting test, little test of the political system. Uh, one more point. Bob Reichauer made excellent points in the uh, proposal in the Baucus package does for some number of years, I don't remember how many, set that cap for the excise tax at a higher level for high cost regions of the country. What I don't understand from either a policy or a political standpoint is, is why the Finance Committee, why Senator Baucus's mark doesn't add a second adjustment. It would not be that complicated. 
to say that if an employer's workforce, or let's say if the pool of people getting in a particular insurance plan has an average age over X, that you have a somewhat higher level for the cap, just as you would for higher cost regions of the country. In addition to being reasonable policy, because older people do cost more to insure, uh, I think it would also be good politics and it would take away one of the arguments, or at least mute one of the arguments that's being made against it. But for reasons I do not understand, there is not an age adjustment in, in the proposal in Chairman Baucus's mark. Maya? Thank you. I'm Maya McGinnis, President of the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget. Um, I think many of you on the panel have made the important point that budget process reforms alone will never be able to do the heavy lift of fixing the budget. Uh, and even when we look at the President's proposals, uh, many of them which I think are, are very good and move us in the right direction, they're somewhat watered down, right? So PAYGO at best, uh, something we support, but at best is sort of treading water, make the situation no worse, and with the exemptions would actually allow trillions of new dollars added to the debt. Or the MedPAC proposal, which I think um, is a very innovative and helpful structure, potentially CBO has come out and said, in order for this to really generate new savings, you need to make more changes, like link the MedPAC reforms with specific savings goals. Maybe that's something that will happen. But clearly, budget process isn't going to do this job on its own. And at the Commission, that's clearly something that you all are, are working hard on, sort of what kind of reforms will force fiscal policy changes, and then what kind of reforms will actually enforce those, allow the budget process to make them work better. So if we all agree that policy is kind of has to be the first step, I wanted to put as many of you on the spot as possible, uh, including you, Mort, if you're willing, and ask what single policy each of you thinks would be most helpful to enact to get the deficit situation back on the right track uh, in a timely fashion, given what's going on in the economy as well. I've, I, I've always, <clears throat> well, I don't know if it's policy. I mean, I've, I've always thought that the, uh, that the, the Wolf, Frank Wolf kind of commission or, or something like uh, a Greg Conrad commission where there was buy in, where the responsible citizens decided enough already. Um, we're, we're this, we know that the crisis is there and we're going to do something about it. And then you get, uh, you know, you get a lot of hoopla around it, and the president endorses it, and the president meets with it, and the president, you know, M Mitch McConnell and and uh, and the president are all involved in cho choosing the people, and they and they really partly educate the country is the best answer I've seen. I, I you know, I, I'm I'm a little discouraged by the by what I've learned about the paygo situation where. You have a sequestration mechanism that excludes 95 percent of uh, entitlements um, and leaves. I don't even what, know what the poor five percent of, uh, of of entitlements that would get whacked are. You know, God help those uh, poor. It's not student loans. It's not. Uh, it's. It's. Uh, it, I don't know who it is. Uh, so it is student loans. It is. It's not food. Right. It's not food stamps. It's not Medicaid. It's. It's Medicare with limitations. It's not Social Security. It, it basically is it's student loans and a couple. No, of can, other I, can, can, I, can, can I respond to that? Yeah, I think. No, but I think ahead. this criticism isn't. I want to answer Maya's question, but I do think Mort's criticism, which Tim echoed, is entirely off base. <laughs> the sequestration mechanism in, in PAYGO, and it was earlier in Graham Rudman, the sequestration mechanism in, in PAYGO is fine. It's, it's the, uh, uh, the purpose of it uh, when PAYGO was set up, the purpose of it was never to actually have a sequester. It was to have enough of a threat such that the PAYGO rule would work. And during the eight years that PAYGO was there before the budget surpluses returned. Uh, the sequestration was not triggered. Yeah. And every, you look at the record, every single tax and entitlement bill for eight years was fully paid for except for one bill that was in the middle of the early 90s recession that was a temporary extension of unemployment benefits for which I think you can make an argument in a recession that it doesn't need to be paid for. The question is simply, does the sequestration mechanism have enough in it 
to, to do the job. But I want to pivot to my, because I thought Maya's question was, if you're all saying the issue is policy, not process, so answer a question on what's the policy as opposed to process. I thought that was, uh, yeah. And uh, two parts to the uh, question, to, to the answer. On the one hand, um, it will be very difficult to get agreement on significant revenue increases if they're not accompanied by significant entitlement changes. It will be very difficult to get agreement on various kinds of benefit changes and entitlements if they're not coupled with various revenue changes. So it's sort of hard, I think, to single out a single policy because as was the case in 90 and 93, I, I think in order to make progress, one is going to have to have everything on the table. Uh, this is also a reason uh, why uh, uh, I actually think it uh, would not be productive to be pursuing a multi-year cap on discretionary spending outside of a broader agreement. It makes it too easy. We all know the, the name of the game is taxes and entitlements. That's where the big deficit reduction savings are going to have to come from. And too often they get put to the side and we do little squeezing around the edges on discretionary. And as was the case in 90 and 93, when there were multi-year discretionary caps, um, they were part of the larger agreement that also <laughs> raised taxes and, and shaved entitlements, reduced entitlements, uh, and I think that's where they need to go. So where does that lead you in terms of the one policy? I, I think the answer has to be health care. Uh, that's what's on the table now. That's where the big problems are. Uh, the push needs to be to get through a health care bill that is fully paid for in the first 10 years and has as many promising, many of them we won't know for certain, as many promising, hopeful game changers as possible. And then we're going to have to come back to health care and build on that. Uh, but I think given where we are right now, uh, the principal ball game as a first step on deficit reduction is trying to get a health care bill that uh, has significant promise, including a number of things that properly won't score, because we won't know till they're tried exactly what they'll do. Uh, but I don't know where we are if uh, even in areas like, you know, bundling payments mm -hmm. and reforming Medicare Advantage and all of these things, if we can't do anything at all on health care, uh, we're in a pretty bad place to even begin to talk about other deficit reduction policies. Well, no, we're, we've got to we've got to finish. We don't have we'll a lot finish of time in we'll finish in, in ten minutes. Is that all right? Okay. Go ahead. Rudy. Well, uh, I think one of the difficult things to get across to the public is just how huge the numbers are out there and, and the size of the problem. And uh, the size of the problem implies uh, radical policy changes are necessary, and especially in health care, as has been pointed out. But but I just don't see the public being remotely ready for radical policy changes. So I, I think the best hope is to try and make a series of marginal changes in the right direction, hoping that international markets have the patience to, to give us some time here. Um, so I would do things like try a commission. Maybe it's... Uh, Maybe its prospects for success are, are very small, but uh, commissions are cheap, so why not have one? Um, maybe that commission should have a fairly modest agenda. Uh, we keep saying, well, um, the Social Security problem is much easier than the health problem. Now, that doesn't mean it's easy by any stretch of the imagination, but maybe we should try uh, the easy step first and, and work on it that way. Ultimately, uh, as uh, Bob Greenstein said, uh, very, very significant changes are going to have to be made in our health care system, um, but I don't see anyone really seriously proposing those at, at this time. Yeah, my nervousness about the health care debate is, is that um, we, um, we, we may once again get the cart ahead of the horse. Um, you know, let's get more people in the system and somehow that'll make it easier for us to fix the system. I don't think so. Um, 
that has not been the history of Medicare or Medicaid, and I don't think it will be the history of expanded uh, coverage, whether it's through a government program or whether it's just through government subsidies to get people into a private sector program. I don't, I don't think that, that one necessarily leads to the other. So I, I think uh, even if some of these are unscorable uh, by CBO, I, I think more of an emphasis on these cost control initiatives, particularly in the government programs, but also in the private sector system, uh, have to be um, have to be highlighted and have to be emphasized in this debate. Uh, I do agree with Bob that um, we, you know, it's really hard to get this on a piecemeal by piecemeal basis. Uh, but it, and in answering your question, what what's the one thing we could do, or what is something we could do that would uh, make the most headway? Um, I, I think here again, this needs to be kind of a package deal because things, that's, that's really kind of the only way you can get big things done is to say, okay, there's a little of this and a little of that, but it adds up to, to this much progress. Uh, and if, if, if you want an answer to that question that's not at all realistic, it would be to repeal Medicare Part D, including the outsized subsidies that we give to insurance companies to provide Medicare Part C. Uh, I, I want them in the mix, but I just think we're paying them more than we need to pay them to, to, to get them to provide coverage. And to, and, and to let the tax cuts lapse. I mean, if you want to do two things that would really get us back uh, in a better uh, long-term position, those would be the two things, and neither of those are going to happen. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Academy of Sciences. Um, Bob Reischauer's description of the, what to do with this MedPAC on steroids makes it sound more like MedPAC with a little bit of Gatorade um, <laughs> in that um, it, it deals at the margin of the fee-for-service payment system um, that we're already apparently doing a lot to keep a, a lid on. Um, my colleagues at the Institute of Medicine have spent a lot of time in various roundtables talking about how to provide the right incentives for quality of care at effective cost, and almost all of their proposals have us moving away from a fee-for-service system which is easily gamed um, by having multiple readmissions or by referring people to numerous tests at clinics that are owned by the physicians and so on. So I wonder if there's anything within this proposal that would allow for even experiments that are different from the fee-for-service system as a way of controlling costs or if there's any possibility for departing from that, from that system which is permeates the, the, the government and the private sector system and leads to high costs and often bad care. Yeah, could, could a MedPAC do such a thing? I mean, could it be powerful enough to do such a thing? I mean, everybody agrees that this needs to be done. Um, Tim referred to uh, the Medicare Advantage program, uh, some components of which are the equivalent of capitated uh, health plans. Uh, some are private fee-for-service, which makes very little sense. Uh, so there is, you know, an element in there already, but the American public, uh, by and large, unless you provide extra benefits or inducements, uh, want to keep the flexibility uh, that comes from a fee-for-service uh, type of delivery system. Uh, you know, I think we have to move in this direction. Baby steps have been suggested uh, with respect to um, bundled payments or episode payments where rather than uh, paying for the 50 things that uh, are associated with a, uh, a heart bypass, you give the hospital one lump sum and it's responsible for the pre-admission care and the post-admission care for 30, 60 days afterwards, uh, whatever. Uh, that begins to change the incentives. It's terribly difficult to uh, uh, implement these kinds of changes in a country as diverse uh, as ours, which is uh, in which the medical system is by and large uh, a la carte uh, payment. Uh, so uh, I think, um, you know, realistically, I think uh, Bob's answer and Rudy's answer to the question of what to do. Um, you know, the one thing that we need to do is structural change of our health care system overall. And uh, there's an impact of what we do in the private sector on the government budget simply because it uh, 
uh, relates to the commissioner's uh, comment about the uh, um, non-taxation of, of health care benefits, so tax revenues go up if you can slow the growth in uh, the private sector. Uh, but this is uh, long and complex, and uh, we uh, know in a Kennedy School seminar what to do, but uh, in a practical sense, uh, we don't know if it will work. We, we should add, you know, there's... Uh We've gone through cycles on this health care debate this year. There may have been one part where uh, how much health care cost containment was in these bills was overstated. The cycle's gone to the other extreme. There's kind of this sense, over sense, that there's nothing in the bills that leads to cost containment. Uh, there are these initial steps, like Bob mentioned on bundled payments. You asked about experiments. There actually are parts of the bill on the Hill that have promising experiments in them. Um, and with regard to Tim's point, while I, I v v vote, I don't have a vote, but I, if I did, I'd vote for his health care and let the tax cuts expire and all that. As he said, it isn't going to happen. The thing to think about is the bill on the Hill, uh, let me back up, MedPAC has for years proposed reforms, money-saving reforms in Medicare Advantage. They have gone nowhere on the Hill, yet they're in this bill. The reason they're in the bill is the insurance companies this time around aren't fighting them that much because they're linked to other provisions of the bill that would extend health care to the uninsured so the insurance companies could sell more policies. The same is true with the drug companies and others. The same is true with the bundled payments. Um, th th you may think this is sad, but the political reality is that the only way to get some of these long identified changes like Medicare Advantage reforms and some of these baby steps like the bundle payments Bob makes, you can't move them politically unless they are part of a larger package that expands coverage. So you can say to various interests, you're going to sell more policies. So this is why I come back to the big enchilada right now is this health care bill. And I really worry about the lessons for the political system if once again we completely fail on health care reform and produce nothing. Whereas if we produce something, it will fall far short of the structural reforms that are ultimately needed, but it may be able to take initial steps and get us started on a road where we can come back and build on and make more of those structural reforms. Okay, uh, we've got time for only a couple more questions. Uh, this lady in the edge here. committee and I am struck at the extent over time as the magnitude of our problems have grown that we have reduced the base from which we can solve them. I think ultimately we're going to have to look at means testing, the big now non-means tested entitlements. We're going to have to look at broadening our revenue base because you can't have 60 percent of the people paying all the taxes that fund the basic benefits of government. When, when you get to the point where somebody like me elects to take Social Security benefits and give the money to my grandson to go to college, it strikes me that that is not an appropriate thing for working people to be funding. It's, it's really kind of strange. And, and there are things we can do to broaden the base of options that we have, that the fiscal base that we have from which to solve these problems. If we keep providing more and more benefits to people higher and higher up the income scale and take more and more people off the tax rolls, we're going to make it impossible to solve these problems. Reactions? Yeah, uh, it should not be overlooked that when the budget came out in February, you had for the first time a Democratic president proposing as part of his budget to increase the income relating in Part D of Medicare, excuse me, in Part B of Medicare, and to extend it for the first time to Part D of Medicare. That proposal was in the Baucus framework document that came out last week, I hope, that it was in the chairman's mark that came out this morning. Obviously, it came out an hour ago. I haven't seen it yet. It will be very interesting to see if it survives as it moves through the process in Congress. Okay, one last question in the back.
Yeah, uh, Chia Chen, freelance correspondent. Uh, I keep hearing all this, that, and uh, I think if it boils down, it's a problem of governance. Uh, I would like to get to the very basic. I think the rule of congressional process has been reformed. And the basic reform is this. The minority party have to be respected. In 2000 and 2009, the minority party was kicked out the door. Uh, and I think that's uh, the basic problem. And during your talk, I just reviewed the Chinese history. When a dynasty, the ruling party, if they respect the minority, this dynasty is strong. And in otherwise, the dynasty is weak and even to be replaced. So I would like to suggest the rule of the congressional process have to be reformed and this uh, minority have to respect. The real democratic process is not the waste, it's also east, it's not ancient, it's nowadays. Thank you. Thank you. That's a good uh, good uh, point to, to end on. Uh, it seems that uh, the, the, the answer to this problem will only come if there is a bipartisan solution to the problem, and uh, that then that is the that is the the nub issue here. That uh, we can't get the uh, seem to get the Republicans and the Democrats to agree on uh, on what to do about it uh, because one party only wants to cut taxes and the other party only wants to increase spending, and they they contrive to make it worse. Uh, so, with that uh, depressing thought, uh, let us uh, <laughs> venture forth and see if we can't convince our, our uh, friends, Republicans and Democrats, to get this problem solved. Thanks to the panel very much for doing this.